There's somebody who keeps getting up and going back, trying this, trying that, starting this business, starting that business, starting this relationship, starting that relationship. The Lord is saying, go back and lay down again. In the rest of laying before him, it will become clear to you what you should do, who you should marry, where you should live, and how you should go. To the world that's watching, I know that there's a lot of bad news everywhere, but we've got good news. Yep. We've got positive news that Jesus is still Lord and God still sits on the throne and he's got everything right in the palm of his hands. And we're trusting him uh, to guide us through this season. Not only that we might survive, but that we might thrive in a season of turbulence. Mm. I, I think that one of the things that is so pronounced about God is that he is described as a root springing out of dry ground, mm. which says that the conditions around you don't have to be right in order for you to spring forth. Mm. And that's very applicable to where we are right now. The ground is dry, but the root is still springing up. Mm. And we need to not so much focus on the dryness of the ground. I certainly think we ought to obey all the rules that are necessary to be safe. But at the end of that, we need to go from safe to success, uh, from surviving to thriving. But using this as an opportunity to rethink our lives and uh, use the innovation that this disruption has caused <laughs> to maximize who we are. Yeah. So Bishop, I just can't help myself. When I'm with you, all I can think about is things that are big and exciting and dynamic. You are a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you have changed the way many in the church have even looked at things. I remember reading that uh, one of your conferences, when 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 the when the bishop rolls in the town, you know, it's almost like the circus comes to town because the economic impact on that mm -hmm. city is a hundred million plus. Okay, and cities are vying for the attention of you. You have a you have something on you that I think can come alive inside this season. And I don't want to sit here and talk about doom and gloom because many, many, many amazing things took place because of something bad. And, and you know, Romans 8, 28 mm -hmm. is for real. And you exemplify that. You're here to share uh, whatever you want to share with our audience. So, Bishop, where do you want to start? I don't know where to start after okay. that illustrious lead in. Uh, I can say that I thrive up under pressure. Okay. Uh, something about the challenge ignites the best out of me. When things are bad, that's when I'm really called to action. Uh, I have tried uh, over the past few weeks to uh, breathe hope to people, yeah. to get on Facebook Live. I've been on ABC, I've been on NBC, I've been everywhere, just speaking to our nation, reminding them that faith matters. Yeah. In an environment, we know that here, but in other environments, they don't always make room for a voice of faith. Uh, but it's very, very important that we are a part of the conversation, the narrative. When you start talking about being entrepreneurial, I, I often say to myself, if I could have sang like the Winans, I would have been a recording artist. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> right. I didn't have that. Okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. I would have been requesting myself to sing yeah. uh, or like the Clark sisters or somebody. But the, the reality is all you bring to ministry is all that you are. Mm -hmm. You cannot bring something that you're not. Mm -hmm. You cannot imitate what somebody else has. All you have to bring is all that you are and all that you are is enough. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that what God has placed inside of you is enough. You don't have to sit back and wish you were somebody else. He has pre-designed you and pre-equipped you to accomplish everything that he created you to do. If you can withstand the controversy of being unique, because being unique requires courage. We are much more accepted if we are cheap copies of great originals. Mm. So you have to decide, do you want to be accepted or do you want to be accomplished? I decided I wanted to be accomplished. I've never told you this before, but uh, I was born in between two dead babies. My, the baby before me died and the baby after me died. Mm. And I was raised by a dying father. And there's nothing like death to teach you how to live. Mm. 
Mm. It gives you a focus. It gives you a gratefulness. It gives you uh, an urgency that I probably would not have had normally to live my life to the fullest. I felt like I owed it to my father who died at 48 uh, to live my life to the fullest. My grandfather was murdered uh, by the KKK when he was in his 20s. And on behalf of my dead grandfather, my dead father, and, and my dead siblings, I was blessed to live. <laughs> and I wanted to live my life to the fullest and to do everything that I was created to do without fear and without favor. Oh, we're all blessed that wow. you lived. <laughs> I mean, look at the millions of people that one life can... Yeah. Don't make me cry now. <laughs> no, we're all going to be teary-eyed in a minute. I know, I know it. Um, you are representing, I think, an attitude inside of a season that mm -hmm. whether it's the best of times or whether you think it's the worst of times, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as a man thinks, so his he is mm -hmm. the way the Bible says it. Speak to that. Uh, you you seem to be declaring that things could happen even in this season of COVID-19 that we're in. Oh, absolutely. First of all, God made us slow down and think. Okay. <laughs> you know, he has a way, uh, he maketh me to lie down in green mm -hmm. pastures. And so this shut down and shut in and shut up <laughs> that he has ordered <laughs> <laughs> the three shots. Where's the shut up part? I don't know if you figured that out. Yeah, yeah, I just added that in, because you know, I'm stuck in the house with my family. Shut up. <laughs> but I heard that. All, all of that is a, you're going to use that, aren't you? <laughs> yes, all of sir. that is a great opportunity to recalibrate. The, uh, in corporate America, there's a term called disruption that is very, very frequently used. And a lot of companies go down in disruption and a lot of companies thrive in disruption. Mm -hmm. And the difference between one or the other is your uh, AQ and the AQ is your adaptability quotient. How well you adapt to change has a lot to do with whether you survive or thrive. Being able to adapt in moments of disruption and adopt new ideologies and find a way to minister to the flock or find a way to create a job now that you've lost a job or find a way to write the book that you've always wanted to write. Now you've got time to write it, you know, to do the painting that you've never done. Now you've got time to paint it, to start a blog, to start a company, to, to find out what is in your inventory Come on now. Uh, that, that has laid dormant behind your job. And now you have the opportunity to explore the relationships and the possibilities and the potentials of producing those things. I think the word production mm. is something America is learning. We're suffering right now because we started being consumers more than producers. And now everything that we need to combat this disease, we're having to get from somewhere else. And we're having to retool ourselves as a nation wow. in order to make simple things like a mask. You know, when you think about that, what happened to our country? You and I grew up at a time that we had a lot of production going on around and it was the industrial age. And then there were companies like Monsanto and Carbide and, and, and Pittsburgh Steel and, and motor companies were, we were producing. We got away from that and started consuming. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just the nation. I think it is a cultural mentality mm -hmm. where we become more adept at having a cell phone than making one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we need to retool ourselves to become producers again. And that needs to start with individuals, not companies. What are we doing to produce? The first thing God told Adam was be fruitful. Wow. Okay. And I'd say to people all the time, you can't be fruitful if you're not seedful. The difference between being fruitful and not being fruitful starts with the fact that you have seed, which is potential. Bringing it to fruition is to be fruitful. God knew Adam had seed, so he only called out of him what he placed inside of him. Mm. And in moments of adversity, that's what God is calling out of us, mm. what is locked down inside of us. Mm. Wow. That's so you good. don't become what you want to be. You become what you are. So what are you waiting on? Right. And if there was ever a time to be aggressive and, and you know, I, you know think of, a, think of a, uh, somebody that has a restaurant mm -hmm. and 
Support now, your local restaurants. Mm -hmm. Now they are getting that takeout side of things mm -hmm. tooled up right now. Yeah, they have to. Yeah. They have to. Maybe they didn't have an app before. And maybe they didn't have a delivery service before. But necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're rethinking their business. And I don't think we're going to go back to business as usual. Normal. Everybody says, mm -hmm. when, when are things going to go back to normal? Disruptions, there are no, there's never a normal again. Yeah. We're going to have a new normal after this yeah. as we begin to rethink how to, I know as a church, we're having a new normal. We always streamed, we always had technology, we always had social media, but to the limits that we now push it to is another level that requires what type of staff do we need? How do we tool our organization to be relevant in a time like this? Uh, in an ever-changing world. And the other thing that's coming out of this that I think is important, it's coming in a negative way, but it has a positive consequence. As Americans, we don't think as global as we should. Hmm. TBN always has. But a lot of institutions think that the whole world begins and stops between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Mm. We don't go past California or beyond New York. And whether you're a minister watching right now or whether you're a pastoring a big church, a small church, or a big company, a small company, you need to think globally because we, we need to understand that our, our currency is connected. Mm -hmm. uh, we're connected by disease, we're connected by attack, we're connected by the conditions and the atmosphere, the weather, the world. We can no longer sit autonomously and say, those people are having a problem because mm -hmm. those people shortly become us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're interconnected and we must go back to Genesis and become our brother's keeper in a way that we have never done before. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. You just said the phrase, whether you pastor a big church mm -hmm. or a small church, you've pastored both. Yes, I have. <laughs> For those that haven't heard in a long time and it's so inspiring, uh, West Virginia, Yes. Uh, was where you pastored a small church. What happened yes. all of a sudden? What, 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 and, and, and a follow-up question to that. Were you the same guy you are now back then? <laughs> Absolutely. That's the funniest <laughs> part about it. That's the funniest thing. I think what happened is that God hid me. Uh, it, it, you know, I think that God hid me, and there's nothing wrong with being hidden. Uh, God hides life in the womb of a woman. Uh, God hides butterflies in a cocoon of a worm. Mm. Whenever God gets ready to produce anything that preci that's precious, it goes through a cycle of being hidden. And I think one of the things that people don't tolerate well today is being hidden mm. because they think being hidden is being forgotten. Mm. I spent almost 20 years pastoring uh, in West Virginia in various sizes of small churches, none of them seating over a thousand people. Uh, early on, 40, and then, I mean, we had 40 on Easter Sunday, counting pregnant people and dead people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we might have got to 40. We might have got to 40, you know, if we were really, really lucky. But I needed that hidden time. Moses needed that hidden time. He was hidden in his mother's house. Then he was hidden in Jethro's house. It takes a lot of years for you to be ready for the weight of what God is going to do in your life. I am exactly the same person. Uh, when I came to Dallas, it was scary to me to see that 1,500 people joined the first Sunday. And I was prepared to have to fight my way through like I did in West Virginia, play the piano for the choir, and my wife would be the president of the usher board. We'd just pull ourselves up <laughs> by our bootstraps. And so many people came, I almost ran from them. I thought, <laughs> what do you do with success? Because the one thing that people who have struggled fail to prepare for is winning. Wow, mm -hmm. come on. We prepare for sustaining ourselves through the struggles that, that spawned us. Mm. But we have uh, no business plan, no mantra, no model for winning. And so when I started seeing the magnitude of what God was doing in my life, it was scary. I used to call John Hagee on the phone <laughs> all the time. I, I, I would shout out to John Hagee. He, he would kind of mentor me a little bit. I would say, was this normal? This is happening. Is this normal? Because... One of the sources of great stress in our lives is not knowing what's normal. Mm. If a woman was pregnant and she didn't know it was normal to gain weight, she would think something was wrong. Mm. 
Wow. If she didn't know that it was normal to have a mask on her face, she would think something was wrong. Mm -hmm. If she didn't know that it was normal to be sick every morning, she'd be calling the doctor every morning, she would think something is wrong. You don't have to change any of her mm -hmm. symptoms to give her peace. Just tell her it's normal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you're doing something for the first time, the most frightening thing about doing it is trying to figure out what's normal on this level. And that's why you need mentors and you need models in front of you that help you to understand whether you're doing something wrong or whether this just goes along with the turf. Oh, it's so good. If I say the term to you, a little nine minute clip of one of your sermons. Seven. Seven, <laughs> oh, seven minute clip, seven. It wasn't only, nine, okay. It only took seven. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so if I say to you a seven minute clip mm. what, and somebody hasn't heard that story, what does that mean? Uh, I spoke for uh, Carlton Pearson years ago for his Azusa Ministers Conference. It wasn't even the big Azusa that everybody thinks of. It was his leadership conference that he held at his church. Brian Keith Williams, myself, and Dr. Mark Hamby spoke, uh, each of us having a different day. And uh, Carlton then took those three sermons and put them together into a 30 minute show. When you deduct the advertisement space, we came out with about seven minutes each. Your dad happened to walk into the room at the time that my seven minutes was on and I was preaching uh, a message I called behind closed doors. Everybody else calls it show me your wounds, but it was really behind closed doors. The substratum of the message was that Christ showed his wounds and it caused his disciples to believe. Mm -hmm. And your dad was writing a book called I Had No Father But God. Yes, he and he was struggling with whether to be transparent about mm -hmm. his life and some of the things that he'd been through. And what I said about showing your wounds so touched him mm -hmm. that he called Carlton and he didn't even know my name, described me to Carlton and, uh, and asked Carlton who I was. And, um, and he invited me to TBN. The first time I came to TBN, I was running a revival in Grand Rapids and he called me on a Friday night. I had to go in, I had to talk to Dr. Abney who released me to go. He said, I think you should go. I said, I can't go because I'm supposed to preach for you. He said, no, he said, I think this is a destiny moment for you. My I'll get somebody else to speak. If Dr. Abney, William Abney in Grand Rapids had not done that, that wouldn't have happened either. He released me to go. And my wife and I came into Santa Ana with those big gates that opened up. <laughs> and the, back then they sent those big limousines to pick you up. <laughs> I'm, riding, I'm riding in a limousine, which didn't happen all the time. And I got to those big gates and I didn't know whether to preach or wet my pants. <laughs> I just thought I would just die. Okay, and you lived in West Virginia, at the, to pastoring there. I lived in West Virginia. Was this like uh, 90s? Uh, 90. <laughs> 98, 90, okay. 98, something yeah. like 98. that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it was, I mean, I had never been, I didn't even know which camera to look <laughs> in or anything. It was a green as grass. Uh, went in there to speak and my whole life changed. Wow. Goodness. Yeah, my whole, uh, before I knew it, I had a contract on my desk asking me to do a show. Here's what's funny. I was on TBN for two years and didn't own a camera. Thank you, Lord. I I would take the footage from preaching for people who had a camera, oh, okay. do the glues at a friend of mine's church in West Virginia, and then put it on the air. I did not have a camera. And when people came to West Virginia looking for my church, they would drive past my church. I'd be standing in the door watching them go <laughs> up and down the street. They were looking for some kind of great big church. I was literally in a storefront across from Rose City Cafeteria in South Charleston, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. It does not matter where you start. It matters where you finish. Mm. Yeah. My goodness. You know, we call this time, we, we, call, we have a saying that we say, the productivity of rest. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what you've been talking about, mm -hmm. is that in this, God, it, it's like he stopped everything for yes. us. Yes, yes. So that we can reevaluate and become productive in the things that we might not have thought. You, you know, Laurie, the thing about it, when you think of restoration, the root word is rest. Mm. Oh my goodness. Okay, so if you want to have restoration, you have to first accept rest. Mm. And for people like me, I, I will confess something. That's hard for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Work is easy for me. Mm. My father modeled work in front of me. My mother modeled work in front of me. We are workers. We are industrious. We, it was like a sin to sleep late in our house. So work is natural to me. What is hard for me is to let everything go mm. and just rest. Mm -hmm. But in the process of rest, we find restoration. And what I have learned, if you don't do it on your own, <laughs> he'll do it for you. Right. He maketh us to lie down. Wow. And some of us have the personality types that the Lord has to make us lay down. Mm. If you think of Samuel being called, Samuel kept getting up in the disruption and going to Eli and said, is it you that called me? And the old man would say, go back and lay down again. There's somebody who keeps getting up and going back and trying this and trying that, starting this business, starting that business, starting this relationship, starting that relationship. The Lord is saying, go back and lay down again. In the rest of laying before him, it will become clear to you what you should do, mm -hmm. who you should marry, where you should live, wow. and how you should go. Before the broadcast, I Good. shared with you um, a few things that inside of this unique season that we're in that, you know, is, is been declared a pandemic and, you know, look, just, I know you know, and I just want you to know we know. We're shooting this during the COVID-19. And we're five feet apart. Bro. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tape Not measured it me. out, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Beverly made sure that we were social distancing, by the way, before you, before you came. So, so uh, inside of this season, we're kind of being aggressive here. Uh, TBN has made an offer on a company, and, and I told you a little bit about that, and mm -hmm. and and... TBN was built in a tough season mm -hmm. for the broadcast industry, and it takes a little bit too long to describe, but just trust me, it was the, kind of the worst time in broadcast history, really, is when TBN was built for a lot of reasons. And, and so it feels like you can expand inside of a bad season. Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that work? It, everyone's talking about it. Practically, everyone's talking about retooling and innovation and all that. And all that's super important. What's going on spiritually? I got the bishop in the house here, so talk to us about what God is really wanting to say. Is it, it what? Why is it that these things can happen? We can be productive inside of a really terrible season. If you remember the parable uh, about the fig tree and and it didn't bear any fruit, and Jesus said. Uh, Twice have I come to this tree and yet it has no fruit. I will give it one more year. And he says, dig around it and dung around it. And then if it bears no fruit, cut it down. Digging around it and dunging around it is disruptive and smelly. <laughs> okay? It is disruptive and it is smelly. And yet that was what it took for it to be fruitful. That's what it took for TBN. And you know what the problem is? It's who you hang around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when you hang around the wrong kinds of people, they will, they will make you so fearful, not careful. I want you to be careful. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be fearful. They will make you so fearful that you bury your dreams mm -hmm. behind your fears. But many, many innovative people see disruption as an opportunity to be more fruitful than they've ever been in their lives. Mm -hmm. And in order to really get that kind of mentality, you have to be around those kind of people. People think that they're not doing it because they don't have the money. It is not about the money. It's about the mentality. If you get the right mentality, the money will come. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we think, oh, if I had the money, I would do it. If you're not doing anything with the money you have, you're not going to do anything with more money that you have because that is controlled by fear. Mm -hmm. What you really need to do is have the courage. And if you have the courage and make the right relationships, you can use OPM other people's money. Yeah. God will bring people into your life to underwrite your dream if you are that tenacious, relentless kind of person. My, my dad would always say everyone wants to fly like the eagles, but they're hanging around turkeys, you know? <laughs> and and the, the idea that this really could be the best of times uh, if you can see it that way now. Mm -hmm. So it's vision. It's always going to be that purpose that, you know, uh, talk, to, talk to 
uh, us more about that. We're hearing a lot of the negative stuff on the news channels. Talk to us about being productive in this season. Well, it's like the stock market. <laughs> when the stock market goes down, everybody wants to take their money and flee. Yeah. And depending upon what age you are, I understand it. At a certain age, you want to protect your assets. You can't afford to wait for the market to come back up again. But the people who have been the most successful in the market, when times are really bad like this, mm. they don't run from it. They run into it. Yeah. You can buy the stocks a, a dime on the dollar right now. And then when the company, when the country comes back up again, you've got more than you could have ever afforded because success is always born out of people who see adversity as opportunity. And if you stop and start to look at adversity, in fact, when it comes to business period, your business is twice more likely to be successful if it is built around solving a problem. So you need a problem to have a great business. A crisis. Yes. We heard um, on one of the news channels, we were just flicking by, uh, Lori and I were, and, and we both saw someone say the irrelevance of God and prayer in a thing, mm. in, in a time like this. Kind of, uh, I think, we, we only caught half of it. Yeah, I think it was kind of a... No no purpose in this modern society. Yeah, and I think I think it was in reference to maybe a prayer that uh, the vice president had had made. And okay, what's your uh, what do you want to say about that? Well, let me say this about prayer. I, I stay away from the politics as much as I can. But the thing that people don't see about prayer that I think is vitally important, it might not be relevant to you. But to the one who is praying the prayer, if it stabilizes me, mm. if it anchors me, mm. if it releases creativity in me, you might not say that it's valuable to you, but it was valuable to me. Mm. I often tell so people, good. you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, good. Uh, so good. I often tell people that God doesn't make chairs and he doesn't make tables. He only makes trees. Mm. And, and so I'm not saying that you should pray till you see a table because God's not gonna make a table. But if praying calms you to the point that you look at a tree and now you see how to make a table, then prayer puts you in a place of provision. So you see what I'm saying to you? Oh my God. <laughs> so when you start- the bishop. That's exactly why he's wearing the purple sweater. <laughs> yeah, the purple sweater. <laughs> uh, come on. But, but, but really, prayer anchors your soul. Yes. Come on, and it releases your creativity. And it tells you what to do with what you've got. Mm. Because if you look in the scriptures, I'm getting excited. Come, Come on. on now. If you look in the scriptures, almost every miracle in the scriptures occurred by the prophet or Christ using something that the person already had. Mm. Whether it was two fish and five loaves of bread or the pot of oil or the handful of meal, mm. it was something that was already in the house. The prophet didn't bring the meal. He just caused her to see it differently. Mm -hmm. He didn't bring the oil. He just showed her what was already in her house. If you pray, God will show you something that is unique, that exists in your house, that he will use to bless your life. Mm -hmm. Good Ooh. Lord. You know, Bishop, one of the, my favorite stories is about the little widow who had all she had was the empty jars. Mm-hmm. And that was her greatest asset mm -hmm. were those empty jars. And he says, go get, mm -hmm. Elijah, go get all the empty jars mm -hmm. that you can possibly find. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's our emptiness greatest, was her the, the emptiness mm -hmm. was the she greatest asset that she had. The thing about that story, the pot of oil continued to flow until she ran out of empty vessels, showing that God is mm -hmm. endless in his supply. Mm -hmm. It is a matter of, your capacity. Mm -hmm. When you start talking about greatness and smallness, I don't think that everybody was meant to lead something great because they don't have the capacity to handle the stress that goes along with leading something great. And that's why you ought to be careful about coveting something that belongs to somebody else or inheriting something that you don't have the capacity to handle. Mm -hmm. You have to have the capacity that is commensurate to the opportunity. Right. How do you expand your capacity if you feel like that's something you need to work on? What, what would that's you do? That's a great, oh, that's a, that's a good old <laughs> interview question there. Uh, everybody can't think to ask you the right kinds of questions. The thing, I think that when David killed the lion and killed the bear, mm. 
Mm. He was expanding his capacity, working himself up to the giant. Got it. If you kill the small thing that's in front of you, mm. it will increase your capacity to go after the bigger thing that's coming before you. Mm. And so if you don't do anything with the lion, don't talk to me about the giant. You have to work on the level that you're on. First 30, then 60, then 100 fold. You, God is not going to give you the 100 fold opportunity if you haven't maximized what you have. The man with the one talent buried his talent mm. and was cursed because he buried it. It wasn't that it wasn't enough. It was that he failed to do anything with what he had. No matter who you are on the level you're on. I can see right now talking to you. Can I tell you what I see? Come on now. On the little raggedy back porch out from our kitchen that, that my mother had in the little house that we grew up in, there was this big pot that she had. And she took cucumbers that she raised out the garden and put vinegar all over them mm. and put them on the back porch and yes, made sir. pickles. Yeah. And then she canned them. She took apple peelings and she made uh, preserves. She took pe peaches and made preserves. That's not big stuff. That's not a big corporation. You won't find that in the grocery store. But she did something with what she had. Yeah. It, miracles begin with things that are in your house and within your reach. And we spend most of our time complaining about what we don't have, crying about what we've not been given, frustrated because we see our neighbors with something that we don't have, rather than valuing mm -hmm. Who would have valued cucumbers? Who would have valued apple peelings? Mm -hmm. My mother said, don't touch those apple peelings. Now I throw apple peelings away. She said, I'm going to make uh, apple jelly out of that. And she boiled them down and put sure gel in them and put them in mason jars and, and put them up under the... She, it's about value. It's capacity and then valuing what you have. And most of us have little value over what we have because we're so busy coveting something we saw somebody with on TV. Wow. Is it true that perfect love casts out fear? That's, that's truth, yes? That's true. That's biblically okay. true. So is it also true then that the opposite of fear is perfect love? Mm -hmm. So perfect love is not thinking about how we should try to love God, it's understanding how much he loves us. Mm -hmm. So in a COVID-19, you know, weird season that we're in, we should be dwelling on God's love for us because mm -hmm. that casts out fear. Yes. Can you speak on that? First of all, uh, I have to be careful talking about that because that's uh that's an area that's really sensitive to the core of my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I, the one thing that I know for sure is, is that he is for me. Mm -hmm. I have always known that he is for me. Yeah. Uh, that helped me when others were against me. Mm -hmm. I knew that God wasn't on the fence about me, mm -hmm. that he loved me. Mm -hmm. He may have to chastise me. He may have to correct me. He's not always loved everything I did, but so far as loving me, you have to be sure that he loves you. Number two, agree with him about that love. Wow. If you disagree with him and take your opinion out of it and just say, Lord, I don't see what in the world you see in me. I don't understand it. I can't relate to it. But I, by faith, agree with you in loving me mm -hmm. so that there is no discord between me and my creator that I am valuable. And that casts out fear. That casts out fear of people, of your own failures, of your own insecurities, of your own incompetence. Everything they said I couldn't do, I ended up doing it because I agreed with God. Mm -hmm. I could have agreed with the teacher who said I'd never be a great writer. She said, you write too colorful. You know, the, the, the <laughs> sun dripped down beneath an alabaster sky and cascaded down into the leaves as they danced in the wind down into Come darkness on. as the evening <laughs> ebbed upon the night. I like to write like that. Okay. That's, that, that, <laughs> you just I wrote that. a song. <laughs> that, I, I, I like to that. write like that. They were trying to teach me how to write like a journalist. Yeah. Succinct, mm -hmm. just the facts, no color. So she uh -huh. X'd up all my papers and col uh -huh. colored them all red and said, you'll never be a great writer. And I've had maybe 15 books on the best New yeah. York bestsellers list. <laughs> you, you cannot agree 
with the adversary. You have to agree with what God says about you. Yes. And if God says that about you, agree with him. If you know things about yourself that make you feel unlovable, if you've made mistakes and, and you're still in shame and guilt, just agree with God about you, that he, he thought enough of you to send his son to die on the cross and traded him for you, mm. that he would get the judgment that you were worthy of so that you could get the life that you could never earn. Mm. That is the gospel. Lead message. him to the Lord. If you, if you can understand that in your heart and in your spirit, I know what it is to walk in shame and guilt and grief and confusion about myself and feel so unworthy of his grace and mercy. But listen, friend, when God saw you and saw his son, he chose you. My goodness. And he offered up his only begotten son that whosoever, that's got to be me and you, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe in all the disruption of COVID-19, God has gotten your attention that there's more to life than stuff. All the stuff is shaking. All the universities are shaking. The medical centers, everything's shaking. The only thing that's not shaking is God. Wow. I want to challenge you to build your faith on something that will not shake. And if I could, in this moment, just pray with you that you could be stabilized. I know your life is shaky. I know you don't know how you're going to pay next month's rent. But let's stabilize you and then we can stabilize it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I need you like I never needed you. Thank you, Lord. Come into my heart. Ah, oh, forgive my many sins. The atrocities that keep me up at night. The embarrassing shenanigans that made me hide my face from you. I'm so sorry I ran from you. Now I run to you. I give you my life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and give me new life and purpose. And let me agree with you that I am valuable because you say so. I accept you as my Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen. Friend, it's well. It is well with your soul. Friends, no matter what trouble you're facing today, God has already provided the wisdom, courage, and strength you need to stand. For your gift of support in any amount, we're going to send you Joel Osteen's new book, You Are Stronger Than You Think. Please go to tbn.org forward slash stronger than and thank you for being a part of this global television ministry.